afternoon, everyone, and welcome to ISCM's third virtual town hall of the Egypt chapter. In last few days, we have been discussing with the thought leaders in understanding the role of technology, big data, analytics, planning, sourcing, etc. ISCM brings you today to its last town hall series of the Egypt chapter, discussing the future future and understanding the evaluation of logistics and the industry perspective towards the same. Our thoughts leaders would soon join us for the same. As an institution, we are into education, training, research, and consulting, and we offer globally certification courses in the domain of demand planning, IVP, supply chain, procurement, and we are very well known for our leadership program. Currently, we are successfully running a batch called R4, helping us deal and understand uh, supply chain in such uncertain world and reimagining the new supply chain. Do visit our website www.iscmindia.com for further details. Certain ground rules. This platform is on listen only mode. And on the right hand side of the control panel, you have a question tab wherein you can send in your question, which will be answered post the panel discussion. Let me go ahead and introduce you to our thought leaders. We have Tanuj, Global Head Logistics from Jumia. We have Nadar, Supply Chain Director from Stella Di Mara. We have Hesham, Head of Physical Logistics from Nestle. We have Amir, India, Middle East and Africa International Trade Lines Readiness Manager from PNG. We have Dr. Rakesh Singh, Chairman, Institute of Supply Chain Management. And we have Shanmukh Singh, Supply Chain Enthusiast at Institute of Supply Chain Management. I welcome you all on the stage and request Shanmok to lead the discussion further. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I would like to thank the speaker for accepting my request to participate in this webinar today. I would also like to thank the audience for showing up today. We come to the concluding webinar of the ISCM Virtual Town Hall YouTube channel. In the first one, we discussed how to leverage technologies in logistics and supply chain to reduce cost and minimize waste. And in the second webinar, we spoke about the resolve to reimagine, create, and restore supply chain planning post the COVID crisis. You can check these on our YouTube page, ICM SCM Pro. Coming to the third webinar, we will discuss supply chain logistics and network designs and how we can optimize these networks to create resilient, reliable, sustainable, bionic, robust, and agile supply chains in the future. Logistics, supply chain, and network design is a complex interconnected flow of products in various stages of its life cycle. From the unfinished raw material to the various levels of manufacturing, light manufacturing, or assembly as it's more commonly known as, and finally turning it into a finished product, as well as making sure it reaches the end customer in a safe and a reliable manner. In other words, day to day operations of companies that make products available to customers. This seamless and often unnoticed activity is what supply chain and logistics is all about. But this is changing rapidly. Customers are demanding more and more visibility in the supply chains of products they are buying. This has led to major shifts in the logistics industry where visibility was promoted as a countermeasure for dealing with complexity. Now it boosts customer satisfaction as we imbibe transparency in logistics. But the irony is that the visibility that create, was created to serve complexity has not even allowed us to salvage the highly exposed supply chains we face today. I invite the speakers to share their learnings from the current state of logistics and supply chain industry in Egypt during the post, during and post the coronavirus crisis that has possibly been the disruption of the century. Some people refer to this as the much needed stress test for supply chains. Amir, I would like to call upon uh, you to talk upon uh, to talk about the impact of global logistics uh, post the pandemic. Thank you, Chamo. Uh, first, I'd like to thank you for uh, this great opportunity to be among this uh, uh, unpicked uh, talents uh, from the region, and especially from Egypt. Uh, the pandemic has affected 
the logistics industry in 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 a, in a very uh, you can say circular way. So mm-hmm. first, he started the lockdown uh, for certain markets that supplies raw material or supply even finished product. Most importantly, are the raw material because they are even uh, have the effect to stop the production on other uh, countries or other uh, regions. The second thing, so this is one thing, the reduction of the flights, no flying. That means no demand on the oil and gas uh, industry, which also dramatically decreased the prices of the oil. Uh, of the oil, we can, we, we can see we have all witnessed uh, something that happened for the first time. That at least that's the first time that I've even witnessed to see that uh, the cost of the barrel is coming below uh, one dollar or even uh, with minus values for the upcoming uh, deals. That happened because no one wants uh, the oil anymore. It's not needed. No traffic. Nothing is uh, uh, is moving between the countries. This also led to the reduced cost and other opportunistic uh, small benefits, if you can say, that reduced a little bit the cost of the of the moving, which you can say that it uh, affected the region somehow and Egypt especially because some of the shipping line started to take uh, the path of, uh, of Good Cape instead of reaching into Swiss, uh, Swiss Canal because this is uh, the cost of the fuel is much less than the cost of, the, of passing and this increased also the lead time. So you can see that it, it has a, a lot of uh, domino uh, effect if you can say. Uh, this was all of a sudden happened that you in, 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 in suddenly you don't have supplies you from China you don't have supply from India it made a lot of turbulence uh, to the markets this stayed for maybe a month until the industry itself and the destination they started to find other solution either uh, to depend on longer lead time, to depend on other supplies, uh, other supplies that they can uh, reach out to. And most importantly, uh, some industry was depending on the uh, airlines to traffic their material, raw material, and especially the, those uh, industries that don't consume large amounts of uh, raw material, like uh, pharmaceuticals, for example. We had to move into uh, maritime uh, uh, transport. So, so that's the effect that I can uh, see. In, in, in a nutshell, there was a turbulence in the market or in the industry. Then again, they again were able to adjust itself until it find the normalized. The, the normal stage that the, it, it can uh, get back to again. I don't see now that we have any uh, issues in uh, getting our supply from China or India. This all has passed. And if we can learn something from this is that we need to be prepared for such things. We need to have plan B and plan C and just keep them in your pocket until you... Uh, You are mute. You are mute. Thank you, Amir. Hesham, can I call upon you next? Can uh, I would like you to describe how the transportation and warehousing industry uh, went through the crisis and how did it play out in the transportation and warehousing industry? Sure. Thank you, Shamu. And. Uh... When it comes to transportation and uh, warehousing, uh, at the beginning, um, I would say the impact uh, on the on the on the companies uh, has been, uh, I would say, diverse. Uh, so, for some industry industries, the impact was uh, an increase on demand for instance, pharmaceuticals, uh, uh, food and beverages. Uh, commodities, uh, producers, and so on, uh, and this has in, has created a huge surge uh, in in the orders. 
which accordingly created a bit of a complexity, uh, adding to uh, the curfew uh, that was in place at the beginning, uh, the, in some cases, uh, shortage in labor and workers and, uh, and so on. In other industries, the impact was uh, that uh, the slowdown in the demand uh, and in some cases a complete shutdown, uh, which is reflected on the other side from the logistics perspective uh, to have their complete operations uh, stopped. Uh, on the whole uh, industry, I, I would say uh, we take it uh, transportation differently than warehousing. For, for the transportation, um, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, so the, the transportation industry in Egypt is uh, two areas. The, the, the transportation operation that's happening within Egypt and the transportation that's happening from Egypt X to uh, 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 cross borders, I mean, to maybe the Gulf, uh, Jordan, uh, Sudan, and some uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, countries next to us. So uh, in this area, we have seen uh, after the pandemic and after the outbreak, some countries, uh, some neighbor countries have took an aggressive uh, uh, actions to limit the entrance of uh, the drivers from outside the country. So, for instance, Saudi uh, decided to uh, uh, not to enter to ban any driver that's coming out of Saudi. So, in this case, uh, the drivers uh, having shipments coming from Egypt to Saudi, they move to uh, until the border, and then the shipment or the product is being transferred to another. A truck that is at the other side uh, of the border, in, in I mean, in, a, in an interim uh, space, uh, and accordingly, this uh, uh, truck is being is coming back inside Egypt and it didn't leave Egypt. So, what does this mean? This has created uh, a bit of uh, excess of supply uh, of the available trucks in the market uh, for at least the first uh, two months, and we have experienced uh, a bit of uh, uh, um, and a decrease on the prices of the transportation uh, from from that area. Um, from our housing perspective, I would say the opposite has happened because uh, everyone uh, was a little bit panicking. Uh, the, everyone is getting prepared to the second wave, uh, and accordingly, uh, uh, most of the uh, companies especially producing companies, uh, would be uh, uh, holding more stocks to ensure supply uh, in the next, I would say, six to nine months. And accordingly, the demand on the storage space in the market has increased. Uh, and I would expect that in the near future, we, would, we, would may, we, we may face an issue of a storage uh, uh, issue. Um, so, so different uh, impact on both areas, and my comment here would be that uh, if if it is a producing uh, company, then uh, they need to consider their uh, I would say six to nine month uh, demand of storage space from now. Uh, they need to take their buffers and accordingly uh, try to secure it uh, from a transportation perspective. Uh, if it as, again, if it is a supplying uh, company, so if it, uh, if it is a transportation company, freight forwarding company, then this is a challenge because the demand has decreased. But on the other side, if it is a customer, so uh, I am the one who is consuming the the, the, supply, the transportation, then it is in, in, in our benefit, uh, or in my benefit uh, from a, from a prices perspective. When, com for, when it comes to oil. Uh, prices, and I would like to comment on Amir. So maybe yes, there has been a huge decrease uh, on the uh, oil demand, uh, on the demand on the oil, and accordingly the prices. But it yet didn't reflect uh, the operation cost in Egypt because uh, prices, or even operation cost, because we're still in Egypt not following the global price uh, when it comes to local transportation, and uh, even when it comes to uh, utilities, electricity, and so. Uh, so that's it from uh, from my side uh, as an impact on the transportation and the, and the warehousing. 
you are muted now before moving on amir uh, can i ask you to switch on your mic even hesham keep your mics uh, keep your videos on yeah uh hesham you can keep your video on too yeah uh, next i'll be moving on to tanuj tanuj can i know uh, what exactly uh, is going on in the procurement and the workforce planning scenario in respect to the, to the coronavirus crisis and even after that how have you been dealing with it uh, sure uh, shanmukh uh, first of all uh, thank you so much for pro providing me this opportunity to be a part of this uh, panel and uh, i think uh, covid has been like everybody knows i would not like to repeat a once in a almost a lifetime kind of an event and uh, that has changed the supply chain for good okay now what has happened on the procurement side is uh, the most important thing is it broke the back of the companies who had dependencies on a single source for their procurement okay so basically if you were only dependent upon one or 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 let's say in in terms of a company or an organization or a geography for your uh, sourcing i think uh, it really dismantled them the companies really struggled to find uh, uh, their products for a production uh, uh, which they needed as a raw material uh, if they were dependent upon one uh, or one partner or one supplier i think uh, the game uh, which was uh, played or rather the companies which flourished during the times were the ones which had diversified their portfolio or had the ability to diversify quickly their supplier base uh, which is through sticking to the principles of procurement basically you need to diversify the risk by having uh, a plethora of suppliers which are graded into different uh, regions different capabilities and you need to have uh, the a category a level category b level so on and so forth so for the companies which had um, the, the risk already mitigated or al already had some sort of a sourcing and diversity were able to manage i like i'd like to give you an example uh, so there are uh, many companies in egypt in uh, north africa and uh, even in sub sahara who are totally dependent upon cross border for their logistics and for their sourcing so it really impacted those companies big time and uh, the change that was brought into the procurement side was that uh, mostly uh, the international sourcing uh from the international sourcing or from uh, a look uh, or from a single source sourcing they were uh, they were forced to change to regional sourcing to shorten their lead times to shorten uh, their uh, procurement cycles and to make sure that uh, the demand uh, that was changing very very quickly okay so the sales team might have given a plan to the to the supply chain team before the covid period for manufacturing uh, hundred of uh, hundreds of spus that changed very quickly in a snapshot of a time i would like to give you an example of uh, our own company and similar companies that instead of selling uh, lifestyle products tvs electronics our percentages changed drastically we were uh, made to procure a lot of grocery items a lot of sanitizers masks and from different sources that we could get and the companies who were able to do this in a short span of time really made the made the the stock difference not in just in their procurement but in their sales as well because as soon as the news uh, clicks in that uh, something is going on uh, really which is difficult uh, or, or or like a pandemic is there so the people really go out and uh, they look for the stuff which they need to have to make uh, themselves so it is like a responsibility of organizations to make sure that they are able to procure and uh, able to put the products in the market as per the need and the companies which were swift to do this who were fast to do this who had the uh, agility and uh, flexibility in their supply chain uh, functions who had better cross functional coordination between their sales team between their marketing teams and their supply chain teams basically here uh, instead of sales teams taking uh, the decision of what to be produced uh, it, the it was market which was taking the call and also the ability of the supply chain team to handle different portfolio of goods for example uh, if you have a capable supply chain uh, which can only handle select um, uh, section of uh, uh, goods via transportation your uh, uh, your 
uh, supply chain might not be equipped to handle groceries for example uh, it might be equipped to handle one such uh, type of um, a good so that had a, a really a big dent on the ones which were not flexible but then again for the ones who were able to cope this up or cope up with this and which were better planned and had the better fundamentals were really able to uh, you know make their way in the tough times as well and uh, so this was with regards to the scene in uh, procurement however uh, the workforce part is uh, uh, quite different so from a um, uh, logistics side in the supply chain uh, side you do not expect people to be working uh, you know from home or from remotely even uh, most of the <clears throat> non essential or non uh, essential teams were made uh, to work from home they, they were being procured a lot of uh, so companies were focusing on procurement of their uh, laptops and equipments which can help them keep connected uh, and also in terms of uh, the planning of workforce it typically changed drastically because the usual systems which the companies use for management or rather for planning of manpower uh, they had to put that in uh, the back burner and work on something new which could uh, be uh, working well with the current requirement for example uh, the companies in uh, warehousing or the companies which require manual workflows they would not like their uh, people to get mixed into mingle uh, between different shifts because they have to prepare for the worst case scenario you do not want any person who is uh, by any chance or by uh, any hard luck who catches this uh, disease to be in touch with your uh, other people who are working and then uh, that might lead to complete shutdown of your operations and that might have uh, a biggest impact on your operations and your sales and the entire company in general so workforce planning changed and quickly the companies who were able to procure the protective equipment which was uh, you know widely in shortage across uh, north africa were able to cope up with this better who were able to plan their manpower better who were able to also uh, allay the fears there was a fear amongst the operation staff to not come and join in the work so the organizations who were able to provide better infrastructure the better workplace condition flexible ones ability for the logistics manager and supply chain managers to work remotely helping the teams who are on ground to work in shifts uh, basically led to the evolution of a new form of uh, work structure or work uh, uh, style so for me i i like to give you an example uh, my team 80% of the people uh, who work with me they have not visited the uh, office for uh, 3 months now we are just uh, uh, managing everything remotely though we have to you know be on ground at times but that's just uh, uh, one in once in a while so workplace has completely changed the kind of workplace planning has changed and workforce also has a different mindset towards the job so just to sum up uh, the procurement and with regards to the workforce the companies who had those business continuity plans who had stuck to the fundamentals before and who were uh, looking forward to uh, into their supply chains who had planned uh, for the future were the ones who were able to stick their neck out and uh, make uh, their way into the future as well uh, coming out in the pandemic as the leaders thank you tanuj moving on to nadar who brings a cross industry perspective nadar can i have you on stage yes yeah. thank you very much nadar, uh, you've been working with the pharma as well as the hospitality industry and both these industries had a very opposite uh, consequence reaction uh, dilemma that you must have been facing the, the uh, consequences and the reactions in terms of the pandemic so could you elaborate on uh, how they were different in these two industries and uh, what did you experience Hello, Nadar, can you hear me? I think the picture is frozen. Yeah, yeah. Jason, can you just uh, call, uh, uh, try to get him online? 
Meanwhile, I'll just move on. Hello. The whole supply. Yeah. Nadir, are you back? You can hear me. I'm back. Yes, I'm back. Yeah, uh, Nadir, you can come. I can't see you guys. Oh yes, I'm here. Sorry, Nadir just vanished. No. no problem. Thank you, Nadir. You can uh, start. Do you want me to repeat the question? please yeah so uh, i understand that uh, you work uh, very closely with the hospitality as well as the pharma industry and the consequences and reactions to the coronavirus pandemic have been completely opposite in both the industries so i want you to elaborate on uh, that how did it uh, uh, play around how do you play how did you play around with these two opposite consequences and reactions so uh in regards i am um, i've been working let me start by thanking you all and i'm humbled to be part of this team can you hear me guys is the internet working hello uh yes, yes hello. Nader, we are able to hear you well can you hear very well yes okay let me start uh Thank you very much. First of all, I'm honored to be among these talent and uh, highly, uh, highly uh, admired people uh, in every perspective, in every industry. And um, so, yes, I've been working in two fields of hospitality with, with a supply chain of hotels, seven hotels, and uh, the supply chain uh, as a consultant to many pharmaceutical companies. So, yes, the impact was diverse and extreme in both cases for so for, for the hospitality, for example, the first period in the pandemic, we completely shut down. So by the law and by the government orders, everything was shut down um, completely. But we had some work to do at that time. So we had some work to stock up some strategic items, especially by knowing that uh, transportation would have been impossible and importing some um, critical items for maintenance would have been very hard. So we had to stock some critical items and it was very hard to convince the top management of the hotels while there's no business to stock up some items. Um, so we had to make um, some categorizing and um, I really find that what we've been building for the past couple of years of supplier relationship was very essential in this time. I believe really that uh, supplier relationship uh, and the relationship you have with suppliers would have carried you so much and helped you to reduce the risk and stock outs in the season. So we started by where there was no demand and uh, we had to buy some critical items to avoid the stock out, especially in the hospitality. And I think all of us, we know that in this time we all have to adapt. So the adaptability is an major thing, like everyone has been saying. So we like um, the restaurants change into, into delivery orders uh, instead of hosting people who didn't done the same. So we changed our kitchen to delivery to the resorts around us. So this was the first part of the pandemic. The second part regarding the hospitality, the second part where we started opening again by 25%, then at 50%, we decided to manage. So I've been doing the same concept both with, uh, with the pharmaceutical and hospitality is managing the cost to serve. So we needed to reduce the inventory cost as much as possible. And uh, in, man in reducing that, so we need to manage the profitability, measure the profitability of the, the whole stuff, the things that we're buying and supplying and reducing the SQs of the products and the sizes um, so that we can reduce the in inventory. This was the only way to reduce the inventory as much as possible, especially in the time where we're only working with 25% capacity. So um, we reduced that, that helped us very much, um, reduce the inventory and this helped us to carry. And one other thing I think I've, I came to know and I think we need to understand all of us in this season, especially in the hospitality, we all need each other and we can work with each other. So we've made some deals with um, the neighboring hotels, especially in the region of Sokhna. So all of the hotels in the region we made uh, competition. We made the one pool of inventory, especially for the normal commodities, uh, to avoid stock out, especially when we started opening and the supply was uncertain for some hotels. It was hard to get some supply chain directives of other hotels on board, but finally we did it. And we had one common uh, inventory pool. 
in Sokhna and it helped us to avoid uh, stoppage and stockouts in that season, especially we've been picking up into 50% and we're, we're fully booked, especially in this season of summer. So uh, going back, we had to reduce some services. So that's the cost of service. That's how we manage it. But if you go into the pharmaceutical part, uh, it's been crazy. It's just been going up the roof, the numbers, the orders, and we needed to manage everything. So we needed to reduce the things that does not have profitability. And my always, um, we needed to expedite the SOP, SNOP, sales and operation planning. So instead of having the sales and operation planning every month, some companies I used to do it every week and some companies I had to do it two or three times a day. Depends on the product, if they're working, especially with the products that help with the COVID-19 or some medicine that's helping, helping and uh, in curing it. So, um, so we had to expedite the SNOP uh, and we had to rationalize the, the range of the products um to know what we're going to deal with that's um so i think three three things we've been doing in the industry for pharmaceutical is controlling the profit uh, um increasing the profitability by closing the leaks that that leaks money by managing the cost to serve and the range of the products and um categorizing in the inventory the abc which are the the commodities we need to be working and investing in in this time and what are the products we can tune up or detune on? Do we really need the, the C products or not from the ABC? So we can drop the C and some companies we've done that, just focused all the production and all the inventory on the A commodities. Um, so this helped us to reduce the risk, reduce um, the, to increase the cash flow and reduce the, the stock out. So one other thing we've been facing uh, a big problem we've been facing in pharmaceuticals, especially the companies that have been using the raw material from China. Uh, I've been checking with McKinsey at that time, and we were uh, the, their their forecasting was saying that the stock out from for pharmaceutical companies would be until October. This was in March, until October 2020, and even to Jan 2021. So we need to find another sources. We need to adapt and change the sourcing. Um, strategies that we've been doing and expediting everything in the quality and the approvals and getting samples and getting it approved. And it was a hassle, especially with the range of chemicals that we've been working with uh, in the pharmaceuticals. So it's been it's been crazy, but um, changing the sourcing, uh, sourcing and finding near sources with the company, with the countries that can provide the raw material in time uh, has been crazy. Yes, there has been an increasing cost very much because of expediting. Uh, I think this for all of us. Uh, uh, expediting and extra transportation, like uh, Mr. Hisham has been saying, it was crazy, but we had to adapt uh, with that. That's why I was saying having good supplier relationship with the people who did not uh, face stoppage uh, of their factories, like China, um, and people from Europe who could help us, it was it was a great help. So I think uh, the visibility of the supply chain and having a good resilience with uh, with the suppliers and the customers at that time was was an essential integral part in the, in the flow of the supply chain and uh, to reduce the the risk. And yes, there was problems with customers, uh, customer service issues, high cost, uh, excess inventory, and sometimes stock out. But we had to adapt. Um, accordingly so my my main three things that we'll be talking about always when doing consultancy with pharmaceuticals cost to serve expedite the sop uh, and um, reduce inventory and uh, rationalize the range as much as possible so um, and find good sources as uh, uh, as mr Shem has been saying and mr tanu uh, having a sole supplier yes we've been uh, We've been learning always having an agile supply chain, reduce inventory as much as possible. Having a sole supplier has been always the key uh, factors, but I don't think, uh, I, th I think that yes, we've been changed for good. This is the new normal. We have to adapt and have uh, plan A, B, and C and many scenarios to work in, uh, in this environment. So that's from me. Thank you. Thank you, Nader. The whole supply chain needs a structural, organizational, practical, strategic revamp. Logistics functions today are delivering competitive advantage using the right technology and creating an environment for, of collaboration among business functions. 
technology uh, adaption in the industry has increased since the pandemic first struck us there was a buzz around technology and digital transformation but now there seems to be intent how can we leverage technology to design a resilient as well as an agile supply chain nadar uh i think yes the whole world and the whole supply chain is moving uh, and the technology is playing a big part in the innovation that's coming and uh, the evolution and the revolution that's the next that's coming in the next uh, few years i especially think um the um, analysis the going big on data analytics and ai would be uh, a huge plus yes globalization is um digitalization is 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 what's happening these days and uh, everything is going to a cloud based system right now and uh, it is it's really i think it would be a savior for a lot of things a lot of people would be losing a lot of jobs and uh, the stops would be less but at the same time um i believe we need uh, strong ai forecasting like if i'm going to talk about uh, technology i would talk about forecasting for example or i would take forecasting mainly um i believe right now what's needed is besides our yes we have to go to the basics of qualitative and quantitative forecasting so i think it's essential these days especially in the first part of the pandemic was having a qualitative the experience that was needed from people especially who like i was talking with a lot of companies telling them please find me someone who's been here 2008 2009 uh going through the the problems that we've been all going through and but i'm also asking about how did you invest in having a good forecast um how about investing in getting a good forecast that will help you help you get good decisions that will help you have good demand because if you're not able to have find a good demand uh you you take wrong decisions that will make you pay much because everybody's been telling me why should you be investing in ai right now or artificial intelligence and forecasting and then data analytics and especially in what we're going through right now i say you need to do it right now and because in 5 years everything is shifting especially in the decision making and as the as the scene is changing and we don't know if there will be second wave third wave if anything is going to change ai is going to help you very much so i've been investing personally and in becoming stakeholder in one of the leading companies right now or one of the two companies working in ai forecasting and data analytics right now in the market i believe it will help us to to do things to two two things like gartner says that it say it will help you generate business and and have the recovery scenarios to what we're going through so and i see the emphasis on scenarios right now because you need to have plan 1 plan 2 plan 3 and uh the change is going to be very quick every, at and at any point have many scenarios yes risk and crisis management are important but have many scenarios for all things and also um ai and that analytics will help you have an early discovery of business trends to be informed and to be updated about the business trends how things are going what are you, what should you be investing more in and applying more um and investing in your supply chain more into which part in which products which customers which segments um things very important so using ai right now i think it will help you especially some people are asking me why especially people are using sap systems and oracle the advanced um the the fancy the fancy tools yes a lot of people i would i would suggest nowadays that we don't use the fancy tools don't buy the fancy tools use the small tools that will help you but make sure that you have an analyst make sure that you have the tools the right tools to help you so even if if you're using an excel sheet so but analysis and data analysis um would help you very much ai um give you more flexibility and to be tailor made to your business so it will help you uh, put on all the characteristics and the factors that will help you improve and it's as it either i've been working with machine learning mainly but i have some customers outside egypt that i've been doing deep learning with uh, that have been that has been helping very much in uh, in increasing uh, the accuracy of the forecast and the demand so i believe right now um, using ai would help us to increase our accuracy if you were looking forward um not today because it 
it will not you cannot build on hysterical hysterical data but you're building about get only two weeks of data that you've been having and just build on that and start building and building and iterating and you will reach some point now we reach more than 60 percent accuracy which is very good amount with some customers in egypt most of our customers are outside of egypt but um, i believe investing in ai is a must investing to uh, to have the good analyst and good uh, big data analytical tools is essential for the coming time it will help you catch the market recover and know the business trends and how to move forward in the coming season especially with the, the shifts that we've been seeing right now um, that's what I, that's all from my side thank you nader moving can on I come, can, I, can i comment uh, Shamu, on this? And, yes. and especially on the last part uh, i like what nader is doing in, in this field uh, however, I'm not agreeing on the part that this will uh, co cause people to lose work because, yes, the, the current jobs that we have will change. We will no longer have the supply chain planner or the DRP planner or uh, the production planner, but we have a production analyst, which is Nader is referring to, who is someone who's having a lot of data and a lot of charts that it's presenting to him by some artificial intelligence and he will be able to analyze and take the right decision so uh, if we are as people are not able to embrace this change that it's happening uh, we will lose job of course but if we are not agile enough if we are not fast enough to cope with this because this is happening this is uh, this is a fact now this is happening so we better change now we better adapt our mentality now so we can uh, not only embrace the change but also ride the change and uh, and launch yeah that's what i uh, i totally ag agree, agree with you Ahmed. i there agree with you there are a lot of proponents of the death of supply chain but i don't think it's going to be the death of supply chain it's just the rebirth of supply chain or the it's a resurrection it will be a resurrection of supply chain like the yes. phoenix yeah <laughs> Moving yes. on to the next question, I'm with the next question. You, uh, the logistics cost in uh, Egypt as a percentage of GDP exceeds the 10% benchmark. Some countries uh, like Amir, you might be knowing uh, Germany and uh, Denmark uh, touch 6 to 7% as a percentage of GDP. Since you've worked in Germany and you've also worked in Egypt, what are the reasons of high uh, cost of logistics in Egypt? And what are they doing differently in the developing countries that uh, uh, the developing countries cannot cope up with that kind of competence on the logistics and the uh, uh, supply chain side? It's, we have uh, introduced a very good examples. The difference between the work in Germany and the work in Egypt or India or Saudi or all those developed countries. It's exactly the difference by the uh, GDP uh, percent. You will find Egypt that it's above 10%, India is now 14%. Most of the other countries, even Japan is 11%. So most of the uh, uh, other countries other than the well, very well developed uh, countries, you will find it over uh, over 10 percent usa is 9.5 percent i think now that's the range uh, the difference is that in germany you are able to give a slot for the supplier to come and dock to your station and put the material and leave and the accuracy is by 15 minutes so you give him the slot at 12:30 and he shows up at 12.30, 12.20, he finishes in 30 minutes, and then the next slot is at 1, and then the next slot at 1.30. And the access goes like this, and he is able to, the supplier is able to plan the roads, the traffics between the, uh, 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 the source and the final destination. Most of Europe, as well, if you uh, uh, if you know, is, is you can consider Europe as a big country, as Egypt or as uh, India. Is uh, it's, it's even better than Egypt and India, because uh, the infrastructure, the roads, everything is 
well developed very ready to uh, to have this amount of transportation it's well planned you can plan it you can do anything uh, uh, do your things or do your deliveries on time so you plan it the supplier does not go back empty he takes something with him because you are able to plan so you are not paying for the transportation one way uh, the, the double way he does not go back empty so uh, you are able also to utilize the empty uh, leg of the transport. So that's why it reduces. Uh, and, and I think our countries now, the developed country, Egypt and even India, they are investing in the last five years or even in the last 10 years a lot in, in the infrastructure. You cannot uh, go anywhere now in Egypt without finding a new uh, bridge that's uh, being built a new regional uh, road that's being connecting uh, Alexandria to 6th of October to uh, uh, south of, uh, of Egypt industrial zones. So this is happening now for the last five years massively. I, I witnessed this uh, area four or five years ago in India as well. It was happening. A lot of in infrastructure and, and a lot of ways that being created. This will help connecting the ports to the uh, plants and distribution centers, which will reduce the cost because you will be able to plan it. So the key to reduce the cost is, is being able to plan. If you are not able to plan, then we will have a lot of unplanned uh, costs, a lot of uh, things that you will have to take a lot of countermeasures, which will cost money. So this is, I think, the reason behind uh, uh, what we have in our uh, developed country. The infrastructure is not yet ready. I see a lot of work is being happening uh, in this area in, uh, in Egypt. And I think as well, uh, the logistics uh, industrial zone that will happen or that is, taking, is being developed in uh, Suez uh, Canal area, this will be also uh, a great enabler to reduce the logistics cost, not only for the, uh, the, the country or the <laughs> the, the country-based uh, industries, but also for any other invest, investor that they want to come and invest in Africa, because that will be the port, uh, the gate uh, for Africa, for the rest of the country, in the industrial uh, companies, uh, pharmaceutical, heavy industries like cars and, uh, and machines. So sure, thank you, Ahmed. Uh, logistics industry is evolving. Not so long ago, logistics was a back office, back support function. Uh, but today, logistics has evolved into a strategic function, delivering competitive advantage over your competitors. In today's on the move world, where customer expectations change every moment, how can logistics ensure your customers is serviced on time with the right product at the right price at the right place? That is basically how is your customer fully satisfied? And how can logistics ensure that? Okay. Um, as, you, as you, I will start uh, my answer uh, at the end of your question. So, customer behaviors are uh, are are evolving and uh, and. Um, and when we when we say customer, we, we we say two different levels. We have a customer, and we have a, then a consumer, and it differs. And both are their expectations are also uh, evolving. Their behavior are also evolving. Uh, and on this point, I would say everyone is talking about customer centricity, and this is becoming the you know the the most uh, popular. Uh, a statement that's being said now and what is customer centricity is the key so uh, it depends so um, for an e-commerce business it differs than an industrial business it differs than a, a service business and so on so the starting point would be uh, understanding the customer expectations understanding the customer uh, uh, behavior uh, evolution uh, and then Putting in the, the the proper, I would say, in the relative distribution model and distribution network in place, uh, and 
let me give you one example. So, and, and a very easy one, very simple one, which would be how many of us would uh, choose or prefer uh, uh, ordering um, uh, a meal uh, or a fast food order from a certain restaurant only because they deliver uh, the fastest way. So I would, I would exactly, exactly. So I would, I would prefer to order from a certain restaurant because they deliver in 30 minutes rather than the other one who is also very good in quality um, and taste, but they deliver in 45 minutes or an hour. And here comes the competitive advantage that logistics could bring, could bring to 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 the to the industry. So. Uh, um, again, the, the generation is being uh, uh, completely different. Uh, the consumer, the consumers that are now growing and will uh, shortly be uh, the majority of the population of the world, and of course of Egypt accordingly. Uh, the expectations is very different huh? now. Uh, in the fashion industry, for instance. Uh, everyone is moving into online uh, uh, purchase, huh? so I, I can go to whatever brand, to LV, to Zara, to whatever. I can uh, uh, see what the whole uh, collection, I can choose what I want, I can do the order and it will just be delivered to my doorstep in one, two days. Uh, and here comes again another competitive advantage uh, of, of the logistics. Um, and this will also have an impact on the whole supply chain right? because uh, we may see in the near future some brands that would shut down their stores and move it completely virtual. Uh, and this, by the way, happened in, in, in a couple of, uh, of brands, not very popular, but uh, some of the brands, they have moved completely to virtual. Uh, and they're, st they're still selling and they're actually still uh, growing. And this is the future. So I would say that what the logistics uh, could bring uh, as a competitive advantage or as a benefit is a combination between understanding what the customer wants, what understanding the expectations of the customer, and our capability not only on uh, on the ground operational one, but also uh, our technology and digitalization uh, uh, infrastructure. So you will not be able to meet the customers or our current customers, uh, uh, our consumers are satisfied if you do not uh, provide uh, this kind of service that I can from my mobile phone track the whole shipment uh, and understand exactly where it, uh, uh, it stands. And even if I want a complain, if I want to do a return, whatever, I can do it by just a click on my smartphone. So um, um, logistics is not becoming only, only a warehouse and the truck, uh, it's becoming more than this, a combination between the technology and digital and also the functional capabilities. Thank you, Hisham. You almost answered my next question too, but I'll go on asking it. Digitalization of commerce, mainly e-commerce and hyperlocal logistics. Apart from on-demand logistics services provided through various channels, including digital freight platforms, are driving the transformation of the logistics and the supply chain industry. How can businesses take advantage of these services to reach the customer faster at his or convenience? Tanuj. Uh, I think, uh, yes, uh, Mr. Hesham also dwelled quite, uh, quite deep into it, but I would like to give some perspective which can add further to it by giving some uh, real examples of what happened uh, in different geographies and how companies rather than you know taking advantage were able to add value to the entire ecosystem and for the community welfare in um, the total okay so initially uh, before the covid uh, there was a habit especially there is a big habit in egypt of people going out in big numbers enjoying their uh, dinner sitting uh, for long long times during the night with their kids with their families it, it's like a party time okay so I know how hard it would be for my friends who are here to be sitting at a home and ordering it. But uh, what changed was that after the curfew was enforced, after certain limitations were uh, imposed upon the restaurants that they could not all open uh, during certain hours or fully closed, 
just there are there are many researches which came and told us that 50% of the restaurants will never open again after uh, after covid after coronavirus some said 60% some said 40% so we can only speculate but what really adds value here is only logistics as uh, the core function uh, it comes even in uh, you know uh, prior to marketing or uh, sales especially with the regards to the problem that we just saw that restaurants which are not able to cater to the rest uh, to the customers who can come in and dine and lunch uh, or whatever uh, at their uh, doorstep now have uh, a different mode of uh, uh, engagement that they can uh, still reach out to millions of customers and also not just that uh, reaching out they have somebody who can give you uh, their logistic services who can reach out to the customer they can provide you feedback they can open uh, uh, yourself not just to the ones who were able to you know regularly visit you but uh, services uh, digital services made them exposed to the customers which they were not even catering thanks to both the collaboration uh, between the technology and the logistics side so what would have happened if these restaurants which were permanently not allowed to entertain guests or uh, customers post uh, this uh, all of them are now delivering uh, through different apps for example in egypt we have outlaw el menus and so on and so forth otherwise people were heavily inclined to go out and dine so i think logistics have uh, certainly proved to be the savior uh, for this uh, billion dollar industry or uh, it has saved many restaurants uh, and have them uh, you know exist and thrive even uh, after this time now uh, this is just one example now what what extra things has logistics done or or the supply chain department has done uh, mostly if you see the customers here would uh, the face of the customer would not be the marketing team would not be the supply chain uh, would not be the let's say the sales team it is the logistics executive who picks up the package who goes to the customer he is able to see uh, the customer uh, uh, first hand so every majority of uh, the customer perception or the brand perception happens when the customer directly engages with the delivery associate or the rider or the biker that comes to deliver so it's a great responsibility for the logistics function uh, to make sure that uh, the companies are able to leverage that by uh, presenting an image of the corporation of the people uh, by having uh, the rider equipped with the right safety mechanism by having a proper uh, <clears throat> technology which can you know uh, do away with the need of taking cash we have many such uh, uh, payment modes which can be integrated and this is uh, uh, essentially a collaboration a cross functional collaboration between the digital or the tech side and the supply chain side which has made it possible otherwise uh, you can have uh, 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 different uh, features in you in your technology but if you do not have customers who are able to avail it i think it's useless so in in that sense uh, the supply chain industry has become the forefront become the strategic uh, side which has led the revival uh, not just of itself but for the companies for the organizations which were really hit hard uh, by this so uh, like my friend hesham put up a question who would like to have the uh, fastest uh, delivery for their food so uh, how is this possible it is possible through the data insights that uh, are there and at the end of the day a human being who is uh, delivering a product from one end to the another end as of uh, this uh, era and this makes it uh, a really collaborative effort for uh, from the supply chain side and really puts it in the forefront for the advantage not just of uh, the uh, the company who is providing it but for the entire community as a consumer i can uh, i can now buy uh, any food item any food product or any other product sitting at the comfort home of my home uh, as a business small business i can save my restaurant by partnering with hundreds of or maybe the couple of good service providers that are there so at the end of the day it is a major advantage and uh, not just uh, on the thriving of the business but to the safety and sustainability during uh, such times i believe thank you tanuj
moving on to our next question which will be an open question how can considerations into market geography and infrastructure while designing our logistics and distribution networks makes us economical is there someone who would like to start uh yes i think uh, it's a very uh, good question and uh, this is one of the key challenges that uh, i personally face and i'm sure my friends also face that considering the geography considering the customer uh, uh, behavior considering all these aspects how do you better plan for the cost so giving you an example okay uh, there might be a tier 4 region in a country for example in egypt where uh, you cannot reach the customer daily from your source so what do you, what what uh, a company would try to plan with it is that what is the best mode uh, because customer servicing is the key you cannot forever neglect uh, uh, a customer because if you do 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 so then somebody else will come in and uh, give uh, uh, cater to that customer so the need better than yours and then you will slowly start to lose out so you just cannot have the best piece of the cake with the cherry you have to service uh, at least uh, 90% of uh, your uh, serviceable market and you cannot just leave customers because uh, there is a cost associated with the, there is a higher cost associated with servicing them so there are some uh, different models that uh, have been uh, uh, taken uh, or uh, have been uh, adopted by countries and companies uh, to make sure that they actually take uh, the right approach i'll just give you one such example uh, in e-commerce uh, we offer two sort of delivery mechanisms one is a door delivery i as a logistics executive or a biker or a rider will go to your do doorstep or and deliver to you the product which you have purchased and uh, since i am not able to do this for the uh, close to 10 million population that, that egypt has or any other country has uh, i would also invest in for example pick up stations so now this is the time for collaboration uh, we have collaborated with stores in egypt called aman stores which are retail stores which sell mobile phones and uh, we actually you know keep our uh, packages there uh, and where in the customer can choose them basically what the ones which are nearest to them and that actually saves cost for me as a company and also for the customer he pays lesser of a shipping uh, fee or a shipping charges for the pick up of his product because when i reach to you directly as a delivery associate my cost is higher the new coming at a pickup station uh, which is already having its own space it's having its own other different customer base so the collaboration uh, is a uh, mutually uh, benefit benefiting one for example we have also we have seen in different countries amazon uh, flipkart doing this thing uh, collaborating with the uh, airtel or the telephoning stores vodafone stores or total uh, petrol stations basically they get new customers who they would not have got otherwise without any uh penny of marketing spend so basically the companies who make the customers uh, come and collect them are also potential customers for the existing uh, branches or locations for them so essentially it's a win win thing so companies will have to uh, adopt these innovative measures if they have to make sure that they are servicing the customers which potentially are uh, uh, you know a high cost customer maybe you can reduce the uh, you can increase the delivery times you cannot uh go to a uh, hinterland or a tier 4 location every day but you plan once a week i'll send my uh, truck there and i will definitely find an alternative means of arrangement thereby you do not let the uh, opportunity go by to service the customer he also is able to adapt to that and also takes advantage of uh, that and sticks that adds stickiness uh, to your uh, business so overall uh, considering uh, not just be bound by the uh orthodox means of approaching uh, these uh, customers or these situations is essentially uh, the key to reduce uh, your cost and to have the best cost without even uh, impacting any of your uh, most of your customers can i give a comment also yes Nandir. i think uh, i think also here the, the role of data analytics and customer relationship uh, softwares would be of a great help mr tanu if you can emphasize on this because i believe um having the role of a good crm and a good uh, data analytics would help us very much choose the the 
the geography, which locations exactly. you put, uh, exactly. your pickup stations, customers, where it's, I think it's, it's very important in the coming time. Yeah, I believe Nandar, you put it absolutely right. It's a great problem to solve. Uh, there is uh, data, uh, millions of data points, which are there to be analyzed to put forth where is the right location, which location can uh, be there, which can put, and definitely this can be uh, gotten done by uh, the means of data analysis tools that I think uh, many of the companies are just uh, providing. And, and we also uh, are proactively in internally investing in such mechanisms. So it is not just uh, you know a, a decision taken by a human in, just by his will. It has to be data backed. So we have those systems which tell us that the customer demand here in, in such a geography is these. But of course, we can always better them. We always have a better model to do that. And that is something uh, which is a dynamic and an ongoing thing uh, for us to always uh, evaluate and use. Yes, depends, especially if you want to weigh the cost and the benefits together and to drive your competitive advantage, which which uh, which direction you want to go? The fastest delivery or the best quality or the cheap or the cheapest or so? I think it's uh, yeah, that's the future. So, Doctor Rakesh Singh, can I have some uh, views on this? Uh, I think uh, geography plays a very important role. And let me go to Amit as he's talked about the larger infrastructure being built in Egypt and so in India. I think uh, as you have the regional road, as you have the ring roads, you have the city infrastructure, you have the last mile connectivity with the far off villages. In both countries can see a very different, similar kind of situation. Uh, the new infrastructure in terms of your locations can not only be you know uh, uh, supported by securing a, uh, a petrol pump securing a small network of shops but it also has to be having the mother warehouse which is so appropriately located that it can service this particular uh, smaller uh, units from where the store uh, uh, pick up they become pickup stores and where even the dc direct uh, DCs can deliver goods directly to the uh, these points and to the customers in the bigger cities. I think infrastructure plays a very important role in making logistics uh, actually integrate with the strategy of an organization. If you see in most countries, if you look at China, if you look at uh, uh, Japan, or you look at now in India, and also in uh, UAE in a very small way, you find that there are production clusters, there are distribution clusters, there are fulfillment centers and clusters, and they are so well located that they define the geography and they optimize the whole inventory in terms of any organization which understands this and create facilities. So I think one facility network has to be built according to the infrastructure uh, of the country which also supports the external infrastructure in terms of the way the ports are done. And I don't want to go get into that. I think one of the larger framework in the future would be to see that how do you leverage with this infrastructure, even your control towers and technology. And I think that's the biggest advantage if countries can start investing into control towers, not necessarily by a single organization, by a three peer, but even uh, public-private partnership and control towers. In India, we have opened up the riverways from one of the states in India called as uh, UP, from Banaras, which is the holy place of Hindus, to uh, Kolkata, which is in West Bengal, and Sahib Ganj. And what we see is that these ferries are so tra you know traceable across this belt because the government had invested heavily into control tower infrastructure. We know where it is and when it is reaching. It is done by a government which is supposed to be inefficient in a big way. It has helped a lot of cement companies, a lot of pen companies, a lot of heavy engineering companies to move their goods by the uh, barges in such a simple and cost-effective manner that the cost of logistics is coming down. Uh, as Amir rightly says, 14%. So marrying infrastructure with the logistics 
would be one way to go about and underdeveloped economies or developing economies or more emerging economies if you say needs to give a lot of emphasis on this secondly what happens is post pandemic is also very interesting as uh, anush said if you see securing your supply from diversified sources is going to be a reality in the future and there is going to be reaction in the future on this particular single source no option sourcing from china or any other country if you see you need to build a new whole distribution system for the new facilities which will go local and where the regionalization of the uh, production uh, uh, sourcing facilities will increase secondly as we diversify into multiple countries you need to secure multiple infra infrastructure points and plant those things and hence your securing transport and warehouses whole dynamics may change in the near future and you need to be seeing that how, where do we locate how do we really secure this and are in uh, a players in these regions the third, three pl are really capable of providing that new change and a better service and i think all this would require a very strong strategy and collaboration not in silos but collaboration with the partners who see that you are able to deliver and secure both warehouses and transportation in a most cost effective manner to reach your marketplace and brings customer centricity to your whole design so that's for me uh, so thank you dr rakit ivan if we can have the poll technology provides us with visibility especially iot enabled devices control towers and digitalization and visibility is a boon considering complexities in our supply chain logistics and that network planning and design but how do we leverage this visibility to optimize our networks of suppliers and service providers and our in house operations as well this is again an open question and everyone can start pitching in Ivan, uh, just shut the poll at one minute exactly. Thank you, Ivan. Can you just shut the poll? So yeah, eighty-three percent people agree that visibility. Uh, is going to be the game changer here can we uh, do you guys want me to repeat the question could you hear the question that i asked can you hear me yes we can hear you ask the question again yes sure Technology, especially IoT-enabled devices, control towers, and digitalization, provides us with visibility. And visibility is a boon considering the complexities in our supply chain, logistics, network planning, and design. But how do we leverage this visibility to optimize our networks of suppliers and service providers and our in-house operations as well? Especially in cases of, such as the pandemic, where the complexity goes through the roof. Well, if if you are talking about visibility. You need to visibility is data. If if you have data, data, and if you don't have the visibility, that means you don't have data. You don't have enough data point to be able to take the right decision. Visibility is also uh, being able to use the data to get some flavor of that, some statistics that can help you take decision. This statistic can you can do it just uh, by looking to the data if it's simple or by an ai if it's something needs more compl uh, complicated so visibility is a key if you don't know how many uh, customers that you have for your product and where are those customers laid out where, where are they so you are not able to put a plan for your logistics uh, fleet or for your uh, distribution uh, location to reach those customers. So visibility is a key. Uh, uh, also, and, and this we are talking only on the domestic, uh, the domestic transportation or the log domestic logistics. It's very 
it's not very simple, but it does not include uh, incoterm. It does not uh, include uh, a lot of uh, uh, maritime rules that you abide by, a lot of governmental rules across countries that you need to, uh, to abide by. And this takes you to another level of visibility that you need to have. You need to know the country that you are exporting to or, you are imper or importing to, what are the, the rules, what are the, uh, not only the rules, what are the conditions. Some countries that are, uh, I remember one of my friends in, uh, in Egypt, he used to work in a very esteemed uh, chocolate uh, brand. And I was in, uh, uh, in India and I like chocolate. So I was picking a chocolate and in, I was in India there and I found that it's made in Egypt. So I called him, what, oh, hi, what are you doing? Are you now exporting to Egypt and uh, exporting to India? He said, yes, but you know what? That was very long uh, journey to reach because we had to make sure that the chocolate bar does not melt on the way. So if you don't have this kind of data about the condition that uh, you will have and the, the, pro the products that you are uh, selling or exporting or transporting, I think uh, it will lead to failure. So visibility uh, is a key in such thing. Not that you have to understand the laws, you have to understand the conditions, uh, uh, the ports, everything that uh, will contribute in the transportation or logistics. Can I give another comment? Yes. I would also, to, I, thank you, Amira. I would also like to talk about the other part, the upstream part, because visibility with the suppliers and the raw material and where is your, I think it, it was a must uh, and that will ha save a lot of people who did the risk management and the process management well by having good relationship with the suppliers and have the technology to track where are the raw material exactly. Uh, and when are they going to arrive and plan to, to have a DSI, demand supply integration well. Uh, also, the, as the other part of the coin from uh, visibility, because we need to have a visibility on the demand side and have visibility on the supply side. So the supply side visibility and the touch points, that's why I think having everything on the cloud right now, which is will be the future, would help us all um, to have everything in a timely manner, the, the data, the orders in a timely manner, and to plan our production and have our SNOP in, in a better functioning way. So I believe it's uh, very important. Of course, uh, thank you, Nader, for uh, highlighting. Go on, Amit. Sorry. No, no, I'm just reflecting. I'm just uh, concurring what uh, Nader is saying. If the, 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 the supplier has the visibility, it will be. I was doing the same, but I, I, I'd rather you speak. <laughs> Ahmed, you can go on. I don't think he can hear me. Amir, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. You can go on. You can continue. Yes, I was just concurring on what uh, Nader is uh, saying is that visibility across the supply chain from the supplier till the customers and you take this chain one by one. If you have, if you have total visibility, that will reduce cost. That will give also very good opportunities for, uh, for saving and will, will allow you to use techniques like lean manufacturing or a, a lot of other techniques that can help you reduce the cost and reduce also the waste that it's being uh, uh, placed across the supply chain. Also, Nader, I think you very uh, well pointed out that visibility is needed for collaboration amongst your 3PL partner, your supplier, and within the organization itself. With that, I would uh, uh, come to the conclusion of the session and I'd like uh, Dr. Singh to give some closing remarks. Thank you, uh, Sanmuk. Can you all hear me? Yes. Uh, yes, yes, very well. I think, uh, uh, thank you for such a lovely uh, exposition of supply chain issues and even direction in the Egyptian economy. Uh, 
let me have a little summary and some learning that we have had from you. I would say that when we look at the whole post-COVID disruption of businesses and uh, look at various reports across the globe, you find that there are five such issues which really became very important, which needed to be dealt during any pandemic, and they brought in a lot of uncertainty. Material shortages was the biggest challenge that countries faced. Those who were lucky secured their supplies, as Anut said, but those who were not lucky could not foresee, could not predict this uh, impact and the length of the pandemic had gone for a huge shock. There was a drop in demand, and I think there is a double shot, where the shift in demand because of not any recession, but because of the pandemic, when the world started buying less, shutting down, staying at the home, then worker shortages everywhere because of uh, you know the requirement of pandemic and even the fear to be in the workplaces, cash flow issues which became very big with the suppliers and I think uh, a professor in MIT, David Sinchi Levy, rightly says that there was a huge amount of uh, cash crunch and uh, cash, uh, whole supplier base in China during those period between November to March and April and even today to a large extent are cash stopped uh, affecting the supplies even in the immediate future for the whole world, though we think that uh, their supplies have actually become uh, normal, but because we are not at normal, the supplies may be okay, but when we become, when we go to normal, things may be really worse, and largely there was a planning issue, and planning both supply chain and demand planning. In fact, companies played a very important role. They realized that we cannot play the politics of the uh, departments. Uh, now we cannot work in silos. We need to work together, and hence, when you look at these kind of uh, this thing, what emerged as a strategy and one key take point from the pandemic, which uh, people try to get away with uh, resilience framework was that uh, they started huddling together. And as Anu said, or Amir said, or even Nader said, they were looking at daily and planning, supply chain planning became a daily plan. It was not a weekly or monthly plan. And as someone rightly said, SNOP, uh, you know, started uh, become a daily phenomena. And that daily phenomena, when every department, production, planning, factory, and supply uh, procurement sat together in a warlike situation, secured the supplies, and supplied those into very hyper local way to areas which were not into the confinement and containment zones, areas where, and every day this confinement zones were working. So you had to have enough information from these areas to really be a responsive hyper local market and i think companies started using not only e-commerce but companies in some part of the world including india they started using service del delivery uh, companies to uh, deliver groceries deliver everything not essentially from a retail or an e-commerce framework but even from a traditional mom and pop from retails bringing a lot of life and a uh, lot of uh, agility to the new demand which has emerged and which was changing in a big way. If you really see this, one thing that really bothers us in the long run is that one where we really got exposed and that did not come out well in the discussion is that when you look at your bill of materials, you look at the bill of material of your bill of material to know how do you secure supplies? You find that you cannot be secure by having tier one or tier two or tier three supplier. You need to go to tier two, tier three, tier four, tier five, tier six, tier seven. And I can give you an example of General Motors, which really found that it was in the tier ten that the, the tires could not be supplied and the engine part could not be supplied in 2013 tsunami. And that really created that oh, unless you map your tires, unless you map your uh, subsequent tire, you're not going to secure your supplies because uh, you may be thinking the tire one, tire two, you're very happy. And then the tire fourth is a cash trip. He does not know what to do. He has postponed production. He has laid off worker and that become a problem. In fact, if I have to really look at the outbound one, which was articulated very well by the panel, I don't need to go deeper into it. But I say that there is a need not only for a technology which brings data flow from one point to another and shows visibility, there is a little more than that we need to do. And that is we need to map your facilities, map your partners, map their the assets, map their suppliers, this thing, 
we need to have a geographical map of where does your supply have. So even if a small natural uh, natural disaster takes place, you can actually know that there's going to be disruption there and you can secure those disruptions much faster. And the new planning tools that would have would have a control tower, a connectivity with ML and AI or deep learning frameworks, which really sensitizes with the uh, with the uh, data in a way that they understand the pattern that are emerging and looking at the information from the market, which definitely has to come from the Salesforce and the businesses to be married again to the AI outcome to see how it will unfold in future. I think the future is going to be very different. But one thing that is going to be a very strong learning point from this pandemic in terms of your network, in terms of your logistics, in terms of visibility across the supply chain is that can you resurrect your SNOP and IBP where people start sharing data, people start embracing change, they are willing to uh, see the larger business goals and they facilitate IT as an enabler of this visibility, agility and reflexiveness. And if people cannot work together, as you know, everywhere we see there's a huge discord between different departments, including logistics and sales. If this does not change and we don't adopt a very strong IBP framework of change as single number or single range planning, then even logistics network optimization may become difficult because then they'll be fight, fighting your last bucket in the month would be very heavy. And that is because you have to subserve your the distribution partner that can really create a big, big challenge for any pandemic kind of situation that is at, at this has happened. So I think technology people integration into this technology framework, good structure processes, and a good supply chain mapping and good customer mapping would be the way to go. There's a companies like Resilink and Lamasaf will do amazing amount of mapping and they are really helping companies which have really done very well in uh, during the time of pandemic, including one company in India, Hindustan, Liver and Godrez have been helped by Lamasaf to map every part of their supply chain each schedules and part of the supply chain have been mapped so i think i thank everybody for contributing significantly to the iscm initiative in the zip reason hopefully you all will continue to support us and we want to bring more and more thought-provoking seminars Shanmuk leads the reason and i think thank you Shanmuk. thank you dr singh now moving on to question and answers the first question is on the issue of diversification, I wanted to know how a company can manage diversification of suppliers in strategic and leverage supplier categories where we get economy of co economies of uh, scale by introducing bulk ordering and other strategies to focus on development of business with one supplier. Can you repeat the question one more time, sorry? Sure, sure. Uh, he wants to know how a company can manage diversification of suppliers in strategic and uh, ways and leverage supplier uh, categories where we uh, get economies of scale by introducing bulk ordering and other strategies to focus on the development of business with one supplier. I am uh, okay, I think uh, I would like to take that question. Sure, Tanuj. Okay, I think it's an excellent uh, question uh, in terms of what it wants to uh, have uh, that uh, you need to have those uh, right balances in your approach towards having the right diversity of your supplier base and uh, to have that at the right cost. I will give you two examples. Uh, uh, one such example might just be from a, a normal 3PL scenario where the services that you take are just transportation services. The other example, uh, maybe I will take the later, could be from an FMCG or from, a, let's say, uh, any sort of a bulk procurement, commodity procurement uh, per se. So starting with the first one, that how do you diversify? Okay, Basically, it's a business principle that you do not put all eggs in one basket. So how diversification helps and how it is a natural phenomenon of uh, your processes uh, is something which is critical to understand. So while we have a, a let's say a good relationship with one supplier who is able to uh, fulfill all our demands whenever we ask, he's able to give us the bulk discounts 
or uh, the volume based discounts that we have negotiated he is aligning with all our uh, contractual terms and everything okay but that puts a lot of risks uh, the lot of risk uh, into our own organization for example the supplier himself failing to procure his supplies due to some uh, issues or having an internal issue of related to production or any setback at his location or his uh, facility can directly impact you big time and you will be pushed at least two three months uh, behind uh, with your competitors so and when i say it is a natural consequence of your processes and your uh, 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 future capabilities that you want to build diversification can easily be done by following the basic principles okay uh, which means that you define as per your business what is the maximum business that you give to a particular supplier depending upon the quality that he is able to give providers the quantities the 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 contractual uh, provisions that you have in terms of uh, the agreement that you have basically it can be a big risk not just in terms of supplies if he does not uh, want to change his contract immediately or puts you in a situation while he has uh, or somebody has faced the challenge of procurement of increasing the prices then basically you are left in no man's land so how is a is a natural phenomenon or a natural consequence that you would actually have to carefully analyze by having um, the number of uh, suppliers that are available in your uh, region and that might be local international the second step is uh, do the basic uh, follow the basic fundamentals that how the vendor analysis is done how the vendor scorecard is done how your risk profiling is considering all those parameters so it's a basically fundamental question and once we have done we have to uh, internally align uh, within the principles of the policy of the uh, of the company that what is the maximum business that we can uh, provide to a partner so that our risks are mitigated uh, eventually what we have seen what i have seen uh, i have worked in five organizations uh, so far in all of them i have seen that it brings a sense of competition not just a sense of competition rather a real competition uh, amongst your suppliers rather than having one who is you know a long term partner and put 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 himself in a comfort box it will really make sure that all suppliers are raising the bar in terms of quality or in terms of uh, the, the their contractual terms that they have with you and they will start competing with each other that will not happen immediately for that there has to be certain uh, amount of time which has to be uh, given so uh, if you think that while having this done you will be able to reap the benefits immediately that will not happen so this is a long term or a medium term uh, exercise that each and every company has to do so that they do not end up having them, themselves into a situation where they think of gaining large amount of uh, gains but end up in losing everything so this was one uh, case that we have uh, and in fact this can uh, grow on to the second example which i would like to give uh, is uh, in in procurement of certain commodities that you do procurement of uh, any related material so every supplier is talking to each other in the market okay so we should not be uh, thinking that we have the best supplier and we should stick to it everybody is speaking to each other now is now it is the time for visibility and visibility does not mean that uh, before you you know ring uh, uh, your supplier on the phone they quickly have chatted on the their whatsapp groups to uh, uh, agree on the rates or anything that you do so that is a common practice so these are the things which uh, businesses should be aware of and they should always be uh, uh, cognizant of the fact that without diversifying uh, their supplier base uh, they will not be able to build a sustainable uh, supply chain organization or a function within the organization moving on to our last thing we don't have much time left but this is a very interesting question other you got out how technology will change uh, how we work what we work on now the here is a question is there ever going to be a substitute for human delivery assistant delivering orders um largely we have all talked about drones and uh, this is about automating last mile but automating transport at uh, large 
is it really possible uh, the, the uh, can we have autonomous trucks drones doing the deliveries in uh, countries like ours like india egypt or uh, even other uh, developing countries is it possible because i think if a crow flies into our drone the drone's gone on uh, the on uh, our infrastructure is not very well capable of handling autonomous trucks we will have road accidents and what not so yeah in that context is there ever going to be a substitute for a human delivery assistant delivering orders will the, this yeah, part of the, the question would, yeah, yeah. the question is do we need that so the question is do we need a drone to get your uh, things to your uh, doorstep you might is the question the question you is, might. is the drone capable of doing it? It's capable of doing it, given that you have the right infrastructure. So if you have the right infrastructure, you will be able to do this with the drone. If you have the right infrastructure, you, you can put a Tesla on the road. She will read the marks and she will deliver you to the uh, where. But if you are putting a Tesla in the roads of Egypt or India or even Saudi Arabia, it will never be able to do this because there is no marks. And uh, one of my friends who's living in Saudi Arabia, he was uh, probing to buy a Tesla. And they told him, we will give it to you, but we are going to remove the uh, autonomous driving from it. We cannot commit to it. Why? Because your infrastructure is not there. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So you're, get, you're getting a, 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 an electric car. And the Tesla is very uh, well known with the autonomous drive, not it's not anymore the only electric, uh, electric uh, reliable car. There are a lot, a lot now. But the autonomous drive is the thing that maybe differentiate Tesla from the rest of the other uh, electrical uh, car, and they are happy with it. But, you cannot uh, do this in, 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 uh, in, 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 in such infrastructure that we have in our developed country. So, uh, however, however, it's sometimes, or it, maybe in the future, you will have the need to have this like certain pandemic that you cannot have uh, things hand to uh, or delivered in human and we need to minimize risk we need to do such thing the infrastructure will be uh, uh, created and thus but the technology is there it's ready the flying cars the technology is there but the problem is oh, do you need to implement it do you need it now is it worth it to invest a lot of things in the infrastructure yes i can give you a demonstration that she, the, the the drone will go from a to b but can i make a a network that it, it's depending only on the drone I, I i don't think we need it now I, and uh, we are ready for this I I it it to comment. Uh, opinion okay, Last I, comment, I, uh, we have run out of time can I comment also on this? Yes, last comment. Yeah, actually, also, Amir, in Egypt, we have laws against having drones in Egypt, actually. So it's against the law. We have, we have to have that. This is just something that we can change. <laughs> yeah, so I don't, think, I don't think this will change. We need to have the authorities' uh, alignment, huh? Yeah, so <laughs> actually, I think it's not about having drone like Amazon already had the patent for having a balloon and a drone and everything. Uh, they got the patent for that. So I think, yes, and maybe in the future at some level it will happen. But not in yeah, Egypt or in the Middle East. So. Yeah, there are demonstrations yeah. for such technology that you can move things from a place A to place B. But it's not, I, uh, it's not economic, it's not. Uh, at all, but I, I think what what might the technology be effect on the human factor? I, I don't know. Me and Amir might uh, disagree on this, but I think uh, the, our need for a human factor would be essential and will be must and will never change. We are a barbaric uh, animals who love connection and love talking to each other. So this will not change. Uh, and people who want the customer service at the end, they want a human being, not just an automated uh, chatting and. Uh, a good CRM who can get the feedback of the customers. They still want the human beings. The stops, the stops in the chain might decrease. I think so. I think the stops might decrease, and instead of having a big team, we're having a smaller team. But I think the need for human beings will never change. It's, we we love connection. We love to work with each other, and we want somebody to interact with, and and we can get angry, and he can absorb us. And this this cannot be done with a machine. You will destroy the machine or 
So <laughs> I believe uh, this is a must. Maybe the stops will shrink. I don't know, Amir, if you agree with me or not. This not, but uh, I, I totally agree. I totally agree. But what I mentioned is that the the, the machine will never take the place of the human. Agree. Yes. This sort of work will be, instead of having 10 people doing it, will be another two, two people who can do it. But the other eight, they can do something else. And this will make the business to prosper. And then you will, they you will be requested to hire more people. They can uh, increase their productivity with the use exactly. of technology. Exactly. exactly. You exactly. increase your productivity, yeah. use it for technology, uh, more okay. business, yes. more prospering. Yes. It's, it will oh, never, God. the machine yeah. will never. Uh, <laughs> Let's come to the conclusion. Jason, can you just uh, yes. give the thanks? It's very interesting. Uh, from my side, thank you to everyone. Thank you for, to the audience. Thank you, Nader. Thank you, Tanuj. Yeah, thank you, Asian. Thank you, Amit. Thank Jason, you. over to you. Thanks, everyone. Pleasure. Hey, thank, thank, you. thank you, everybody. I think, indeed, a very much insightful session and a good debate and uh, insights yeah. from all of you. Thank you for sparing time and coming for the discussion. I again thank everybody, Amir, Hesham, Tanoj, Nadar. Thank you, Dr. Singh, and thank you, Shanmuk. It was indeed a good takeaway for the audience. I would like to thank all my audience also for coming and being a part of the webinar. And uh, I would like to thank Yvonne, Shanmuk, and entire ISCM team for making it happen and success. Thank you very much. Do visit and follow our websites and check out our social media sites. Do watch our videos on YouTube and subscribe them.